First of all, let me thank uh, the government of Brazil and all the friends here very warmly for the hospitality and, of course, very uh, warmly to my friend, Judge Lelio uh, Corres Bentea here and Bentes Correa and many others like Yoshi over there from the ILO who've helped. I'll try to be rather succinct because the time is a bit short and you know how pressed we are in terms of time this evening. But anyway, I thought that for this topic I'd ask myself this question and I'd like your help in responding to this. And the question is, is this, creativity among the courts, creativity among the courts, that's the question underlying justice system that I'm addressing today. But the question is a very personal one because I come from a country, Thailand, where the system, the judicial system is civil law based, code law, Napoleonic, even though Thailand was not colonized. And yet elements of common law crept in, particularly with judges being trained in England and uh, other influences, of course, uh, very famously international law because we're now becoming parties to many human rights treaties. And in southern Thailand, we have Islamic law being applied on family law and inheritance. So the word eclectic is a very important one that we should bear in mind, eclectic nature of the justice systems with which we're faced. So I'd like to make these comments in that light. First of all, even if the formal system of courts uh, is there, we do have an informal system as well in terms of local mediation, village mediators, wise men, wise women helping out, and we should not forget the informal side, even though I'm going to deal primarily with the formal side this afternoon of courts and lawyers and uh, judges, etc. And even where the courts exist, there is a plurality of courts that we have to deal with. Um, child labor may land up in a labor court in regard to labor law. Where abuses are committed against children or where the children are actually prosecuted for some misdeeds, they may la land up in a criminal court or a juvenile court. Civil action could be taken up in a civil court. And constitutional cases could lead to a constitutional court where it exists. But one intriguing question is this, and I need your help. If there are religious courts or customary courts, what is the role of these traditional courts on child labor, if at all? It's not an easy one to respond to, but it should be thought about. Secondly, we are faced with a variety of laws and policies at the national level. Many, many, in my country I can count about five or six laws that pertain to child labor, ranging from criminal law to child protection statutes to labor legislation, etc. But very often, as we know, the challenge is lax implementation or poor implementation, while, of course, we look towards some good practice as well. Thirdly, international law is generally clear as guidelines and strictures and prescriptions for us. But do we follow it? The standards are there, particularly with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 189 international labor organization conventions, particularly the famous 138, being referred to all the time in terms of minimum age, but some countries are not parties to that yet. And yet, 15 is an important figure for a minimum age. And then we have 182, 18 is an important figure for protection of children from the worst forms such as child prostitution, child pornography, uh, child soldiers, child trafficking, etc. But even if, even if countries do not accede to these treaties, I think the international message is clear, it is incisive, and it should be carried through. Whether or not a country accedes, the message should be clear, such as the need to prohibit the worst forms of child labor in relation to children, particularly those under 18, must be protected absolutely. The need for a minimum age of employment in relation to other matters, usually set at 15, flexible for 14 in regard to develop, developing countries. And the need for all children to access school, at least free and compulsory education, and interlink that 
with the age of child labor that we have to bear in mind. Fourthly, even where a state, a country becomes a party to an international treaty, including a treaty on child labor, there's an issue as to whether the treaty becomes enforceable directly at the local level. Can the courts locally invoke the treaty directly or not? That's the question. The answer is varied. There is the so-called monistic approach, monistic approach, which views international law as part of the national system without the need for a national law to transform the treaty into binding law at the national level. For example, the Netherlands. The Convention on the Rights of the Child can be invoked directly in the courts of the Netherlands. However, by contrast, you have another system at work, and that is the dualistic system, dualistic system, which dictates that for international law to be applicable locally, it must be transformed into local law, usually by case law or a statute of parliament, usually. And that is the situation in my country. An international treaty cannot be invoked directly in the courts without a transformative local law. However, with regard to the dualistic approach, pending a law to transform a treaty into national law, could the judges be a bit more inventive, creative? In some systems, the judges may be a bit more creative by using a liberal interpretation of a law, being guided, inspired by international law, even though not bound totally, but at least be inspired, such as to incorporate through judicial liberal interpretation the principles of non-discrimination and best interests of the child, which are international principles. Fifth, as will be seen below, some courts, such as in India, led by enlightened judiciary, take a flexible, creative approach towards grounds for and admissibility of claims. They open the door to public interest litigation or class actions where the interests of children and the community at large are invoked broadly without necessarily being based upon proof that each person has been affected directly, what the courts call locus standi or standing. You don't have to be strict on standing or locus standi in regard to public interest action. But in other countries, public interest action or class actions are very limited, including in my country. Sixth, gender sensibility, victim respons responsiveness, child-friendly procedures, child and family participation, and respect for the child's views have been recognized increasingly in justice systems and related laws. In many countries today, we've witnessed changes to incorporate into the justice system, for example, trained teams to interview children, videotaping of evidence so as to avoid re-traumatizing the victim, community, family support and participation, such as restorative justice and family conferences. And a key implementation is that where a crime takes place concerning child labor, the child in the midst of all this must be seen and treated as a victim, not as the perpetrator. The most obvious case is where a child is used to peddle drugs. The child is an instrument of crime, whereas it is the adult behind the act who is and should be seen as the criminal. Likewise, when a child is found in a situation of prostitution, it is he or she who is exploited and not the exploiter. Seventh, there is an expanding notion of jurisdiction which enables the acts of the wrongdoer to be caught outside the geographic confines of the state of his or her nationality where it interrelates with child labor, particularly its worst forms. Some countries, for example, have adopted extraterritorial criminal laws to incriminate the acts of their nationals and sometimes residents, even when they are committed in other countries. For example, Swedish national does a bad thing in Thailand, he or she is caught by Swedish law, especially when he or she escapes from Thailand. Extraterritorial extra, uh, territorial criminal law being applied. Likewise, we can talk also about um, extradition of people across borders, but many countries do not like to extradite their nationals to other countries. On another front, irrespective of the linchpin of nationality, 
Some countries are exercising their jurisdiction with universal spread, what we call universal jurisdiction, to prosecute persons for international crimes, such as the use of child soldiers under 15 years of age as a war crime in order to try them before their courts, even when the accused are not citizens and nationals of those countries. For example, two people from Africa are now being prosecuted in Germany, even though they're not nationals of that country, for a crime committed in Africa. And finally, my eighth observation is this. Where the national setting is unable or unwilling to deliver, resort may be needed to the regional and international levels to access justice and remedies, including regional courts, such as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Costa Rica, many cases concerning children, the European Court, the African Court, etc. And famously today, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, the first case in the ICC now decided upon concerns child labor, particularly the use of children as child soldiers under 15 years of age. And I will talk about that very shortly in a moment. So let's look secondly at some key examples. For example, a constitutional court in Colombia being creative in ensuring compliance with international law in a decision in 2004 which found that a section of the national law of Colombia concerning children, Decree Law 2737, was partly unconstitutional since it did not comply with the Child Rights Convention and the ILO Conventions 138 and 182. That's according to the Constitutional Court of Colombia. Examples from Brazil include, for example, the case of Federal Public Ministry and Gilberto Andrade, where the Penal Court of Maranao State in 2008 found that the federal justice system was vested with the power to cover slavery-related crimes since the latter violate human rights, including the constitutional right to human dignity as well as social values and labor standards in Brazil. The court found Andrade guilty of fraudulent recruitment and subjection of workers, including a 16-year-old boy, to de degrading living conditions and constraints on movement. In another case, a labor tribunal in Brazil fined the municipality for failing to take action to protect a child laborer. This was the case before the regional labor court of the 19th region, Ministerio Público de Trabajo and City of Maceo in 2009, where a child working at a garbage site had died in the process. Consequently, the court imposed a heavy fine and ordered it to be used for child protection. India, and you'll hear more from our friends here, has been a crucible for an active judiciary that has pressed the executive branch to take action to help children in labor. It has led the way with public interest litigation or class actions. For example, in 1996, in Meta and state of Tamil Nadu and others, the Supreme Court directed the Union of India and state governments to identify all children working in hazardous processes and occupations to withdraw them from work and to provide them with quality education as well as to set up a welfare fund for children. Additionally, in 1993, the Supreme Court in Unish Krishnan and state of Andhra Pradesh ruled that each child in India has the right to free education until the age of 14. More recently, this year, 2013, two very creative cases. In, Bak in the Bakhpan case uh, and the Union of India, pursuant to complaint lodged by an NGO, the Supreme Court of India ordered the executive branch to take action, including the registration of over 75,000 missing children in the country, and made many orders, including uh, uh, the setting up of standard operating procedures, as well as shelter homes for the children. In another case, which I found recently, the High Court of Punjab and Haryana in 2013 stated that the employment of children up to 14 years of age, whether hazardous or not, was totally banned. The court identified this lacuna. The Child Labor Protection, or rather the Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act of 1986 focuses on the prohibition of employment of children in certain specified workplaces which are harmful for the children and there's no absolute prohibition. 
upon reading of that act. However, the court pointed out that another act, another later law, the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act 2009 raised the bar of protection in regard to guaranteeing children's right to free and compulsory education between the ages of 6 and 14. Taken together, those two laws, including the Labor Law and the Education Act, according to the court, the interpretation progressively meant that the ban on employment of children up to 14 years old should be absolute, covering both hazardous work and non-hazardous work. And therefore, the Child Labor Act itself was no lo longer constitutional, bearing in mind the new act concerning compulsory education. However, interesting also was the fact that while judicial creativity in that act uh, was and is welcome, some limitations are also visible. The court in the 2013 case in Punjab and Haryana, as mentioned, did not go as far as to use the age threshold of 18 as posited by the ILO Convention 182 to ban the worst forms of child labor because the country is still waiting for accession to that treaty. However, it did say that a way of dealing with the issue of up to 18 could be that the state commissions for the protection of child rights could be invoked under the Commission for the Protection of Child Rights uh, to cover cases of child labor between the ages of 14 and 18 as a possible way of indirectly prohibiting child labor in hazard activities up to 18. On another front, in another, on another continent, the United States judiciary has made interesting use of the Alien Tort Claims Act, civil claims, uh, extraterritorial to cover misdeeds in other countries, including on child labor. Meanwhile, in Europe in 2013, the Court of Criminal Appeal in the United Kingdom overturned four convictions of people, including Vietnamese children, trafficked into the country and forced to work in a cannabis factory. The court effectively highlighted that these persons, children, should be seen as victims, not perpetrators, and also where there are reasons to believe that a person is a child, she, he must be treated as a child. In regard to the relationship with customary law, a court case in Indonesia recently provides an insight into the issue. Is a person who is under 18 years old but married to be treated as a child for the purpose of protection of child labor? While customary law in that country regards the person in such situation as an adult, the Supreme Court took a different approach based on international law and the Child Rights Convention. In other words, even if you get married before 18, you are still a child for the purpose of child protection. Whatever the customary law says, international law should be followed. But what of religious law? Please tell me. What of religious law and religious courts? This is an area deserving further exploration. For instance, today, in one country which I have to cover for the United Nations, Various religious courts have been set up in conflict areas. A continual challenge is to enable them to comply with international rule of law and human rights. Could these courts, religious courts, also commit themselves to the protection of children from the worst forms of child labor, such as to pronounce against the use of children as soldiers in conflict areas? Question mark. Question mark. On another front, cases applying extraterritorial law, particularly on child prostitution, have appeared in many countries, including the Swedish case that I referred to earlier, affecting Thailand. Meanwhile, at the moment, in a German court, two Rwandan rebel leaders are now accused of war crimes in Eastern Congo. The case is pending. In reality, while the cases and courts above shed innovative light on the subject, there are also many cases where the courts do not function well at the national and local level, while suffering from lack of capacity, transparency, quality, and access by the victims themselves. At times, therefore, where there's no remedy at the national level, maybe we have to seek it at the regional and international levels. This is illustrated by the case from France, Siliadin and France, 
which concerned forced labor of a girl brought from Africa and used in domestic work in France. While some remedies were provided by the courts in France, they were found to be inadequate when the case was referred to the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court said that France should adopt clear criminal laws against the cases concerned rather than the remedies had, which had been taken so far. More recently, the connection between the national system and international justice was tested before the International Criminal Court, particularly in the Lubanga case concerning a rebel leader who was found guilty for using child soldiers under 15 years of age in a war situation and was sentenced for the first time to 14 years imprisonment as the first case of its kind. Let me round off with some thoughts for the future. For the future, some directions are preferred, bearing in mind the experiences conveyed. One, there is a need to ensure that national laws on child labor comply with international standards, as well as to invite all countries here and elsewhere to ratify and implement the key conventions, such as the Child Rights Convention and their protocols, as well as, ILO, as well as the ILO conventions, at least 138 and 182. Two, Invitation to build the capacity of courts and judiciary to apply well international standards through curriculum development for judges, education and training. And I note that the ILO has a training center which can cover judges, so please use that. Supplemented by case analysis of situations and adequate quality incentives for quality performance. Three. Introduce and strengthen child-friendly procedures and personnel, such as interdisciplinary teams, psychological support, and victim-friendly procedures and technology to protect the victims, assist in healing scars, and prevent further traumatization. Four, an invitation to work with families and communities and children, including NGOs, to offer child protection and tackle the environment of poverty and other deprivations which are often behind the exploitation, while recognizing also that there are situations of exploitation which are not due to poverty at all, but due to other forms of exploitation, primarily criminal conduct and criminality. And finally, five, let us open the door to easier access by the victims to the justice system, both formal system the courts, etc., and informal systems such as the role of village mediators, leaders, women's groups locally, such as through public interest litigation and broader vistas for exercising jurisdiction to counter violations, such as through extraterritorial criminal laws, universal jurisdiction, and the complementarity between national justice system, regional system, and international system to ensure availability of both civil and criminal remedies, including compensation, sanctions and recovery and rehabilitation. Creativity among the courts is welcome, even though it is not always easy. It can provide value added to bolster international standards, interacting with local wisdom in a more comprehensive and effective manner. And the crunch ultimately is that justice for children also calls for justice for all. <laughs>